Okay, I think we can get started. So welcome to the afternoon session. Our first speaker is Professor B. Parmeshwar Nair uh, from the City College. And he'll tell us about gaze theories in three dimensions and four dimensions. Please. Thank you, Sujoy. Um, I guess I follow that clock, right? That one? Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so let me start by congratulating Bal again. Um, more than six decades of very impressive work. And uh, so I'm really privileged to have been his student and also to talk at this meeting. Um, as I mentioned in the morning, there'll be many talks covering very many diverse topics in physics. And for my um, talk today, I want to choose a topic that is fairly old, trying to understand the non-perturbative structure of, structure of gauge theories. Um, but it is a topic, although it's old, seems to have some continuing interest. So I'm going to talk about gauge theories in three dimensions and in four dimensions. Basically, we are going to focus on the non-perturbative structures. We're going to introduce gauge invariant field variables, which makes the factoring out of gauge transformations fairly simple and straightforward. In three dimensions, which is two space and time, it will be done in a Hamiltonian framework. The advantage to doing that is because the spatial manifold can be treated as a complex manifold. And that will play a big role in what I'm going to say. In four dimensions, um, to use similar techniques, one needs to consider the functional integral. And I will focus on four manifold, which is CP2, the complex projective space, which is the simplest case one can analyze. Okay, since of course it's a short talk and I won't go over so many details, let me just alert you to what the results would be like. So the key results we find in three dimensions, we will have an anal analytic formula for string tension. This is something of an old result. I have worked on this topic, as some of you might know, on and off for many years. The um, formula for the string tension, I'll just introduce it to you again, just to refresh your memory if you have heard me before. But what is relatively new is an analytic expression that I will show for the Casimir energy in the non-abelian case. Okay. And I will also compare that all these things with the lattice results so one can see how good the approach is. In four dimensions, the key result is the emergence of a four dimensional Bismuth or Witten action, which controls the integration measure for the theory. Uh, the implications of this are still not very clear, but this is very, very new work. So it's still, some of it is still ongoing work. Uh, let me start by giving credit where credit is due. The results on 2 plus 1 go back a long way. Many collaborators, Dimitra Karabali, Chanju Kim, Alexandra Yelnikov, Abhishek Agarwal, and a few other people as well. The Casimir energy is a relatively new work that's uh, done with Dimitra. And the 4D work is very recent work with Dimitra and a very brilliant graduate student of mine, Antonina Marge, who I will let you know, will be on the market next year, looking for a job. Okay, okay so let's talk about um, the two-dimensional case first. Uh, we are looking at spatial manifold, which I can take as R2 or the complex plane C. And it's well known that we can parameterize gauge fields in this fashion. Take the complex combination A1 plus IA2, and that is the holomorphic derivative of a matrix times its inverse. And this is the conjugate exp expression for that, okay? The matrix M we are talking about, I'm going to look at the group SUN for most of what I do. Uh, this means that the matrix M that I'm talking about is in the complexification of the group of interest, which in this case is SLNC. So this is a well-known parameterization in two-dimensional physics. The main advantage of this parameterization is that if you look at how gauge transformations act, it is, of course, inhomogeneous in the transformation in terms of the vector potentials, but it is homogeneous by left multiplication of the matrix M by a unitary matrix G. Okay, so that simplifies 
the analysis of the gauge invariant degrees of freedom. So what this tells us is that if I take M dagger M, which I call the matrix H because it's Hermitian, you notice that the G cancels out in the middle. This is a gauge invariant quantity. It parameterizes the space SLNC mod SUN, and that's where your gauge invariant degrees of freedom lie, okay? That parameterizes the space of gauge invariant uh, fields in the problem. We are, of course, trying to do quantum physics, so we need several ingredients. One is that we need to know how to normalize the wave functions of the theory in the Hamiltonian picture. Then we need the Hamiltonian. And of course, once you set those things up, you would like to solve the Schrodinger equation. And so this is just, by and large, textbook kind of uh, method. The technical difficulties is what we should, uh, that the technical difficulties are what we can overcome by using this parameterization. Okay, so what do we do? To understand the normalization of the wave functions, you look at the space of gauge potentials, you write down the metric on that. This is the standard Euclidean metric you would write down on the space of potentials. And that's the correct metric. It's given to you by the yang mill section as the correct metric to be used for the space of gauge potentials. In terms of our parameterization, it looks like this. Notice that when I take a variation, I'm going to get some derivatives of delta m from here and the d bar of delta m dagger from here, those derivatives become covariant derivatives. I can bring it to this form as shown here. Notice that the two extremities of this expression here with the d bar d in, inside, in between, the two extremities form SLNC uh, Cartan metric, basically, okay? So if I use this result here, then I can factor out well, you can write the volume element in a very simple way. Just from looking at this expression, you see that I'm going to get the determinant of this operator here. And from these two, which form the SLNC uh, Cartan metric, I get the Haar measure on SLNC. Okay, so this is the form of the volume measure. The Haar measure on SLNC, you can factorize exactly. The unitary part can be factored out. There is a coset part. And the determinant in two dimensions can be calculated exactly as the Wiesmann witten action, exponential of the Wiesmann witten action, where C sub A is a adjoint Casimir for the group. Okay, so this is an exact expression that one can derive. It has been known for many, many years. It goes back to work by Gavetsky and Gavienin. And I have shown here for completeness the expression for the Wiesmann witten action. Okay, this is a standard well known thing. The three form is here, there is a two form. Uh, the metric dependent kinetic term here. Okay. Notice, of course, that the CA, the adjoint Casimir, made of the structure constants, is actually zero if you look at the abelian case. Okay. Everything else would go through, as I, as I said before, but this is the point of departure between how the abelian theory and the non abelian theory would work out in the end. Okay. That's a really important. Uh, point. Okay, what do we do then? We can look at the Hamiltonian in the same way. We go back to using these variables that I showed here. And in terms of these variables, you can construct the Hamiltonian. It's a simple matter of chain rule, so I'm not going to go through all the technicalities. The E square term, which you know, you remember, it's delta by delta A square kind of thing when you do canonical commutation rules. So that becomes this term, which I have discussed described, uh, displayed in terms of first derivative with respect to a current and a second derivative. The current is, what is the current that would appear for your Wiesmann witten theory? So that is the variable of interest, and in terms of that you can write that. And the B square term is this term here. So everything can be transformed to this new variable J, and you can construct the Hamiltonian in terms of that. The quantity M, is E square CA over two pi, and this is the basic mass scale in the theory, okay? So, so far everything has been done exactly. There's nothing that, sorry? There is no churn Simons, this is just Yang Mills theory. Um, I have added churn Simons terms in some of the papers, but we'll talk about that later, okay? The, the point is based on this, we can now do a systematic expansion scheme. Uh, 
And I should also emphasize everything is done with regularizations, everything, you know, there's no, nothing uh, worrisome here in terms of potential divergences or anything of that sort. Okay, so very good. So what do we do? We take an answer for a wave function, e to the p, I write it in this fashion. p involves quadratic terms in currents, cubic terms, and higher orders like that, some arbitrary, uh, you know, at sum of all arbitrary powers of the current j. You put that into the Schrodinger equation and you can solve, which seems a little uh, surprising, but it is actually doable. And if you do, the quadratic term has a kernel, which is given here in terms of that mass scale I introduced. Uh, the cubic term is also displayed here. I can do systematically higher terms as well, okay? So the point is that one can actually write down the vacuum wave functional of this theory, at least within certain approximations. This is the part, this expression is what should be used for the low, long wavelength modes or low energy modes of the theory. So this is the, the, the regime of the theory which is not accessible by standard fede popov perturbation theory. Okay. Uh, This is the vacuum with, with no super selection sector. I mean, the super, it's a trivial super selection sector. Yes, but so this is not really the long wave region. Not in this case because there is a mass gap. There is a mass which will cut it. But down. you don't know that that will happen with infrared effects. This, this mass is already here in the Hamiltonian. That is, uh, that doesn't matter. I mean, what I mean is, there could be fluctuations at infinity, which will not be showing up in this. So I have to, this is a vacuum. You're writing the vacuum. In I'm writing the vacuum wave function. But I can twist it with a large gauge. Oh, sure, sure. And that will create uh, yeah. effects at I'm, infinity. I'm not looking at twisted sectors. Yeah. Uh, that really goes back to the question that TRG asked. Yes. If you want to do twisted sectors with um, Chen Simon's terms or things like that. You don't need Chen Simon's. You can just take the vacuum and twist That's it with right. a large if gauge. That's right. If you twist it, then of course things will change. But what I'm trying to do is, let's just do the simplest case, okay? Pure vacuum, zero charge sector, nothing, no super selection sectors, and see what happens, right? That has been, for 50 years, the big problem. We, if we can solve this, at least we make some progress. That was the idea, okay? Okay, so what happens with this uh, wave function that we obtained? Well, we can calculate the expectation value of the Wilson loop which is displayed here in terms of the current J. This is the Wilson line. I calculate the expectation value and you get an area law uh, immediately. And not only that, you can read off the string tension, this coefficient sigma here, that's the area of the curve. And it's given by this simple expression in terms of the casimirs. R is the representation of the Wilson line. CA is the adjoint casimir. CR is the casimir for representation R and E is the coupling constant, okay? So you get this simple formula, and you can ask, does this make any sense at all? And the answer is it does seem to, because people have done using supercomputers extensive simulations of this, this uh, string tension in two plus one dimensions. Most of it is due to Michael Tepper at Oxford, but there are many other authors. Um, here too, I think uh, Haridas and Manjumdar did the work here actually, uh, high precision calculation for AC2. And in all these cases, in every single case that has been done, which is 22 different choices of groups and representations, the answer that is within 2% of this formula. Okay? Yes? This is dominated by the quadratic term. So this is the quadratic approximation. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. We have calculated in one of our papers the corrections. I won't discuss it today, but we can talk privately about it. Corrections are extremely small. This formula is not changed significantly. Okay. So, so that, yes, please. Product of two Casimirs, actually. Ah, because the adjoint Casimir is always there because the interactions, is a pure gauge theory. So the commutator term brings in the, the structure constants of the uh, algebra, which give you the adjoint Casimir. And it also appeared in the mass parameter here that I showed you. 
Okay. Uh -huh. And the R, the representation R appears, of course, because I'm choosing a Wilson line in representation of R. Yeah. Okay. So they both play a role in the oh. final answer. Okay. Thank okay. you. Um, okay. So more recently, we did this calculation on Casimir effect. So the idea is you do the same thing you do for Casimir effect in electromagnetic theory, parallel plates. Of course, we are in 2 plus 1. So if you like parallel lines, you put boundary conditions appropriate to um, conducting plates, which is this boundary condition here, in terms of the um, field strength, the electric field, tangential electric field is zero, and you can calculate the Casimir effect, okay? So here's a formula for the Casimir effect as a function of the distance x, which is in terms of string tension expressed here. The LIs are polylogarithms, and so this is an expression we can anal analytically calculate. Notice the exponential here. There is nothing, no parameter that we can adjust here. There is no, con no adjustable parameter at all. The coefficient A is, if you like, difficult to calculate exactly. In the lowest order, it's equal to one. So we can take this expression, compare with the lattice calculation. Okay, that is what motivated the, us to do the calculation in the first place because there was a possibility of doing a lattice calculation which is a very numerically very expensive, so people don't do that very often. But what we find then is that the two lines are practically on top of each other, as you can see from here. The red line is the lattice simulation done by Chernov, Goy, Molotrov, and Huyen. And the solid blue line is our calculation from this formula. And in particular, the existence of the mass gap is crucial. The exponential here, if you make an error there, it's exponential, the two, graphs will diverge dramatically, okay? So the fact that they agree so, so well over a whole range of distances tells you that these exponentials are really pretty much exactly what they should be, okay? So that is really one of the nice things. So the, again, the agreement, if you try to uh, quanti qu quantify it, it's uh, to within a percent, actually. Okay. The, oops, the parameter A, just one, one second. The parameter A, I said, is equal to one in the lowest order. If you, here I did a best fit, that's 0.97. So even if I simply take the lowest order result, it's going to be just within 3%, okay? So that, so with no adjustable parameters, we can get this to agree. Yes, please. I wanted to ask about the mass gap. So it just came out in 3D naturally? In yes, this? because the coupling constant has a dimension already. So there is no, problem there, okay? Okay. Uh, okay, so that's about three dimensions. I want to see if we can do this in two plus one or three dimensions, can we try to jump to four and see what we can say? Okay, of course, it's going to be a much more difficult problem, but one of the things I want to say is that instead of looking at the complex plane, let's look at CP1, the complex projective space, which is the sphere, is you to mod U1, and if you do that, then the parameterization for the gauge fields can be written again in terms of a matrix M, but with translation operators R plus R minus, which are right translations on the group, okay? You can parameterize the CP1 manifold by an AC2 group element, use that as a coordinate for the space, and then in terms of translations on G, I can write this parameterization. So this is a question we want to ask because this follows straight away from the complex structure and the group structure of CP1, can we do that in 4D, okay? So that can be done, but why choose CP2? Well, I want to say that CP2 is a reasonable space for various reasons. There's a complex structure, which is very crucial for what we do. It's a group coset, SU3 mod U2. So many things we can do just using group theory, which is a, always a nice thing to do. Um, the Fubini study metric on CP2, I have displayed here with a parameter R, which is the radius, which if you take large, it tends to flat space. And even further, um, CP2, of course, has reduced isometries compared to flat space, but CP2 modulus, modular conjugation is actually the four sphere S, S4. Therefore, it's not too far from what we might want to do in a more isotropic situation. So because of these reasons, we thought, okay, let's try CP2, okay? So what do we want to do? 
we can we want to use so there is a if you take cp2 and mod, mod out by conjugation symmetry but complex conjugation of the coordinates involution yes then that gives you s4 so that's a theorem due to actually arnold i believe so some some old theorem in math yeah so at some point maybe it would be useful to use to get to s4 in this fashion so what do we do we take su3 to coordinate as the space which means i have a 3 by 3 matrix s4 yeah from this theory I how can, do i how do i go to i have you have to ensure that all the results are invariant under a conjugation of the coordinates okay uh, all those results will descend to s4 mm. okay that's mm. the idea mm. and so hopefully that can be done okay we haven't carried it out here but okay that is my hope but that the topology is uh, far different right yeah of course so yeah. that could be but other the effects th particularly non perturbative effects that is correct there are things you can do on cp2 which are not invariant under conjugation right which won't descend to s4 mm. but hopefully some of what i'm saying will actually okay okay. Yeah. okay so we do right translations in the group element g split it into the usual way the se2 isospin part t8 hypercharge part these are like the local isotropic group rotating frames on cp2 and the t4 plus it5 and t6 plus it7 and they conjugates they will be the translation operators so those are the complex translations along the complex coordinates of cp2 okay now if i were to look at functions on cp2 they have a mode expansion i can do in terms of the wigner matrices the standard group element elements i mean representations of the group elements in arbitrary representations some of them that's a standard peter weyl theorem the state on the right w must be so chosen so that for functions w must ensure invariance under u2 is u2 and u1 Okay, because they have to be functions descend to the uh, base space CP two, so one has to do that. Can I ask a small? Uh, sure. Small? Yeah, yeah. So the choice of complex structure is something new, extra that we don't see in usual perturbation theory, right? Because this. That's right. Yeah, and that's going to. As for perspective, you don't need it. That is correct, but so you you will see that it's very crucial for me. But there's no unique complex structure. So if you vary, do you like the results won't change? Oh, you mean vary the complex structure? Yeah. uh you could vary the complex structure but for cp2 that's hard to do right i mean okay but you, i could take a large r limit and then start varying the complex yeah, structure yeah. yeah that i can do yeah okay. um okay so what i was going to say was for functions it's there for st straightforward we take this matrices we take the right uh, the action of the t matrices the u2 part on the right should be zero so it gives you functions and then you can expand functions in terms of you know various things like this standard representation theory uh i have yeah okay what about vectors vectors remember u2 here is the local isotropic group rotating the frames therefore vectors must transform non trivially under u2 okay how do they transform they must transform exactly as the translation operators ri and ri bar did because those will tell me what the vectors are like okay so that means i should have something that is that is a doublet of ac2 so it has a two components for the vector and their con complex conjugate so that gives me the four components i need and then the hypercharge should be plus or minus 1 because that's what these translation operators r and r bar had okay so in terms of that therefore i can construct vectors in the following way some of the fun some of the vectors i talk about will be simply derivatives of scalar functions so that's okay that's ri and ri bar acting on some function f but there are others for example if i think of su3 representations in this usual way we do with some indices up and some indices indices down then in that language uh, p plus 3p type p, p plus 3 ups p down or the other way they will also contain representation i mean states which have this property doublets of hc2 with y equals plus or minus one. okay so you can expand in terms of those two so a general parameterization of a vector 
then takes this form. Where here on the right side, I have a P plus 3P representation, and here I have P, P plus 3 type, okay? I here mean takes values 1, 2, indicating that I have a doublet of AC2, okay? And it has the correct hypercharge. So in terms of this, you can write this, and if you actually work out what these states are, these are not derivatives of functions or anything, but they are actually the conjugate derivatives. So if I have the I type index, it's the R bar acting on some quantity here, which is again not a scalar, but never, nevertheless, you can see that it is, it's more like the divergence of a tensor. So if you do that, you can bring it to this form, okay? So gradient of a function, this is like the curve, if you like, of a, of a tensor or a divergence of a tensor. So you have this parameterization here, and then the conjugate is this, okay? So you can actually write down a general parameterization, which by construction we know captures every degree of freedom. You're not losing anything at all by doing this, okay? So these are ranked to anti-symmetric tensors. So this is basically like the Hodge decomposition on the, on the CP2 space. The important thing is that there are no harmonic terms or anything. Okay. You can generalize the non-abelian case by simply noting that this is what you want in the abelian case, which will be like the small, um, it's, it's like a small perturbation of SLNC around the identity. So you can integrate on SLNC and write down the full parameterization like so. So this I claim is a general parameterization which mimics what we did in two dimensions in the four dimensional CP2 case, okay? So that is the idea that we want to use. Uh, I won't go too much more into details of this. I have written this in a slightly different way. The gradient terms are shown explicitly and here the divergence of the tensor I replace by A and AA bar, which are these quantities here, okay? The reason I wrote it like this is if A and A bar are zero, then you can easily see F02, F20 are zero. So anti self dual instantons are also described by this parameterization. So it's not restricted to perturbative fields alone, okay? There are non-trivial configurations you can construct, okay? So what are the gauge invariant degrees of freedom? We get these three guys here. One is our old H M dagger M. And then from this little a and little a bar, you get phi, which I put some extra matrices to make it gauge invariant. And these are the degrees of freedom, okay? So we have factored out the gauge transformations in a completely uh, straightforward way. And now we can ask, can I calculate the integration measure and write down what happens in this case? Okay, here the integration measure is a functional integration measure for the full functional integral, not the wave functions, okay? Again, you start with the, um, the Euclidean measure, standard measure, you write in terms of these variables, you can bring it to this form. Again, there is a factor involving variation of M, M dagger. And if you look at this structure, there is a matrix made out of these operators here. I'm not going to go too much into details. And then these are the variations of the fields, this psi dagger and psi. So you, you can compare this metric with this one without the M, and you can see that the two will differ in volume measure by the determinant of this matrix here. So we can write down, therefore, the integration measure that we need in four dimensions in this fashion. And you can factor out, as we did before, the gauge transformations and get the invariant measure written in this fashion. So, so far, everything is, again, exact. The question is to calculate the, mat the determinant of that matrix, okay? That, of course, is the tough part, and it's not so easy to do. In two dimensions, one could do it exactly. Here, I'm going to do it with some sort of perturbation theory to see what we can get. And what emerges, well, it's not difficult to do, but well, it's a, it's a lot of work, but it can be done, okay? So the simplest strategy is to write this determinant formally in terms of a functional integral over some action. This is not the Yangville's action. This is, a, this is a, a, an action we use just to rewrite this determinant in this fashion. There are two types of fields which enter. One is C bar and C, which are scalars, having zero hypercharge. And then there is B and B bar, which have hypercharge two and minus two. Okay, those are the anti-symmetric rank two tensors, which for CP2 have only one component, okay? 
So if I take this action and just cal start calculating the determinant, I should get the integration measure. Yeah. So what do we do? Well, that's what we do. Not easy to do because you need exactly the propagator for d bar d. Remember, there is, um, oops, where did I go? Yeah, there is d body here, so I need the propagators for these things. And then there are a bunch of vertices. So we do, we write down the exact propagator for CP2 for both cases, for scalars as well as the tensor fields. This can be done, it's nice group theory calculation. In terms of homogeneous coordinates, I have displayed them here. These Z, capital Z and capital Y are homogeneous coordinates for CP2. Um, for y equal to zero and y equals minus two, I have shown here. You can do an ultraviolet regularization by a point splitting method. And we add a Wilson line to get it gauge covariant as well as, so the point splitting is done to ensure that you still have levi civita covariance on CP2, okay? The Wilson line is added to ensure that you have gauge covariance on, on, the, on the space. So at the end of the day, you have a regularization scheme that respects all the isometries of CP2 and gauge invariance. Then you simply sit down and calculate, okay? And here is what you find. There are several terms that we can find. Um, I'm going to, so there is a finite term which I will talk about. There's a, a divergent, linear divergent, log divergent, and then a bunch of additional finite terms. The first finite term here is what I'll focus on. The others are fairly easy to dispose of. Actually, maybe I should talk a little bit about gamma one. Let me talk about gamma one. So there is a, a divergent term here, which is quadratic divergence, which is a mass term for your gauge field on CP2, okay? A, co a gauge covariant mass term is possible on CP2 because it has reduced isometries, and that is what we find here. Of course, it comes with a divergent coefficient, so you had to renormalize the measure to make it finite. Why do you need to renormalize the measure? That is standard. That is exactly like renormalizing the fade popo part of the Lagrangian that you do in perturbation theory, okay? And in this instance, the mass that you en enter here, the finite mass after renormalization is the dimensional transmutation of the theory that you see in the language of the integration measure here, okay? So this is a non-perturbative way to see the dimensional transmutation. Uh, so that is this parameter here. I'm sorry? That's right, here I, here I don't have a scheme dependence actually, okay. Um, okay, so, so lambda QCD, if the, what people call lambda QCD should be expressed as a function of this parameter M, okay. And that's something we are actually calculating now and we should be able to do it fairly soon. But what is more surprising, and this is what I want to focus on, just one more minute is that there is a finite dimension two term, okay? So there is a dimension two term, which is the leading term in terms of dimension counting, but it enters with a finite coefficient, and that is actually a four-dimensional bezumino witten term, okay? Which is quite interesting and a bit of a surprise, okay? And we can calculate the coefficients. It is finite. I have displayed the numbers here, if you like. I try to do it with also an infrared cutoff, if you like. Then the, the point is that if the, what this tells you is that if you look at modes with momenta less than the mass that I put in with that mass term I showed, which means less than what passes for lambda QCD in this framework, then the theory is dominated by the Wiseman and Witten theory, okay? So there is a kinematic regime of the theory where essentially the yang mills theory is dominated by this Bezumen of Witten theory, four dimensional with a finite mass, a finite coefficient. And then this is just a hard measure on SLNC modus UN, okay? So that is, a, is the key result that we find. The implications are not very clear, but the 4D Bezumen of Witten theory has a long and interesting history. It goes back to the work of Simon Donaldson. Um, my student Schiff and I looked at it many, many years ago as well. There's more recent work by Costello on implications of uh, 4D Bessemann of Witten theory. The critical points of this theory are anti-cellular instantons. So there is something going on here 
in a regime dominated by this, but we are not quite there to give you a crisp, nice answer like the two plus one case, not yet anyway. So I'm going to stop here and I won't go through the points again. Thank you and happy birthday, Bob. Thank you very much, uh, Parmeshwaran. We have uh, five minutes or so for questions or comments. Do you find confinement? In the 40 case? Ah. Okay. In the... It's hard to say. I'll tell you why. Okay. If you try to calculate the Wilson line, the 40 Bismarck of written theory, there is no exact calculation of the Wilson line I can do. Mm. However, if I trace and the calculation step by step and compare with the two, di two dimensional case, you realize that the same reason why the 2D theory gave confinement exists in the four dimensions. Mm. And that you would get presumably confinement. But I, I cannot give you a formula for string tension. Mm -hmm. Will it last if you take from CP2 to S4? I believe it will actually, because the the Wilson line expectation value is not sensitive to the complex structure mm. at the end of the day. Mm. Okay. Okay, we have two questions, Bala first and then Denju after that. CP2 and the sections of CP2 are compact. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the in compact space, there are no charges. So, yeah. one cannot even define what is meant by color in this situation. Yeah, yeah. so okay. confinement. Excuse me, let me finish. Yeah. People say that Wilson line and so on, test color, but I have no idea whether that has anything to do with QCD. It is some, seems to be some private activity, which has nothing to do with the algebra observables you started from. Well, thousands of people do it. It's not very private. Let me say, okay. because there is a, if you take R3, there are colored states you can find. Sure, sure. And what has, I think what has to show is that the Hamiltonian of the theory diverges on the colored states to show that there is confinement. I have seen no such proof anywhere in the literature. Okay? And in fact, this Wilson line business, I don't know how it is QCD. If it is QCD, show me what are the algebra observables in that theory, and I don't know. Okay? One has to show the connection to a Hamiltonian, to a, to a time evolution operator. There is not shown. Okay? Okay. So anyway, this is my opinion. Maybe that. Color, quantum field theory is not correct. Well, I have there, no problem with that. No, there are there are several definitions of confinement that one can use. But let me finish. Yeah. So CP2 and S4, CP2 and S4 has no color. Color is zero, like electric charge being. There is no color charge. Uh, but so you can, there is no color, question of color. No, but you color can, confinement. There is no color. How do you see? It? There is no operator for color. It is zero, so you can't see it. How do, in quantum theory, you need an operator to see such an object. What is that operator? I don't know anything like that. Because well, of compactness. Yeah, I mean, strictly speaking, you're not defining color. We have to be strict on this, you know? Um, no, because there are different ways to think about color confinement. When people talk about confinement in QCD, you can ask, what is the, it is at the end of the day a matching between a, an unconfined regime that you describe using perturbation theory to a confined regime where there are no colored states. So it is that transition that we want to understand, right? That's how it is practically implemented in terms of how QCD is applied, you know, to, to describe hadrons. Yeah, if so, it can be done. I mean, color is seen in jet. Okay. Jet physics. No, co color is not seen in jets if I use your strict definition. No, but Co at least there are indications of yeah, color. Exactly. Okay. That's, well, I think that's, but here there is no such indication because there's no operator to test it. No, we, the Wilson line is the operator that you that use. That doesn't test it. That does something. I don't okay, know well, what we can postpone later. I think Denjo had a question. So we can. Uh, just, just before, before I ask my question, just a comment on the Wilson line. The Wilson line is telling you the force between two uh, separating quarks, separating two uh, um, passive quarks, two, mm -hmm. two probe quarks. So it, it, there's, there is some indication of... Sorry? 
infinitely massive if you wish. There are, pro, well, there are two pro quarks, however you, you want to let it. Right. I, um, so if it grows, yeah. Um, I'm wondering about CP2. CP2 naturally has a curvature and a, I'm expecting there will be a trace anomaly in your computations in the end. Uh, it showed up in your dimensional transportation. You, you, conformal invariance of the classical theory was broken. Uh, but right. is your Wessomino Witten term related to that conformal y yes, trace yes, anomaly? Yes, uh, it's related to the curvature in the sense that what you are doing here is to upgrade your 2D Wessomino Witten theory to 4D by wedging everything with the Kähler 2 form. And the Kähler 2 form, as you recall, is actually one of the curvature components, the hypercharge component of the curvature. So that does play a role in the construction of the Wesemann with an action. Okay, so, so that curvature is important. If I take the large R limit, I'll still get a Kähler structure. So I'm not getting flat space with full iso iso isometries of flat space. It will be reduced isometry still. And the idea was to take large R limit and use the conjugation symmetry to see if I could relate it to the isotropic case. That's the line of thinking that we hope we can go. Okay. You but as I told you, yeah, very it, nice talk. this is very new result, so we, don't, we have many more things to say. One last question. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so in two plus one dimension, I remember Singer had an analysis mm -hmm. for the mass gap, right? And yeah. there it was a differential geometric analysis and he ran into some infinity problems Correct. for the sectional curvature. Correct. So uh, does that kind of infinity no, show up? In no, no. And I'll tell you exactly what happens with Singer's argument. Singer's argument is also closely related to the Feynman argument that yes. Feynman tried to do. So Feynman uh, thought that the configuration space could have some kind of compactness. And the E square term is the Laplace operator. And therefore, it would develop a gap because I'm defining it in a compact space. Singer told him that doesn't work because there are spikes running off to infinity, you can have long wavelength excitations which exist on these spikes, okay? So Feynman basically gave up at that point. What we find is that, granted, there are spikes. I constructed the spikes explicitly to show they exist and what they look like. But the computation of the measure shows they have zero measure. So just as it happens with the x square, y square type potential, as you go along the spike, the transverse curvature keeps on increasing, and therefore the zero point oscillation, the transverse direction leaves it, and therefore it has no effect at all. So Singer's argument is mathematically correct, but at the end of the day, irrelevant for the, for the physics. Sorry, Alok has one final question. Sir. Yeah, so so the, uh, maybe I missed it, but small a was the NTE self dual gauge field part, and capital A was the self dual gauge field part in the, you had a slide earlier in the. No, no. Um, I'm not using self-dual things. Yeah, but there was a split, I thought. That yeah, you, this yeah, one. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm just pointing out that if you set little a to zero, you get basically anti-self-dual instantons. I see. Okay. So, yeah, I see. But so long as little a is not zero, there's a lot of... Yeah, yeah. But could, you, could we look at self-dual Young Mills in this language and they do a anti-self-dual perturbation on it using this formulation? <laughs> The, the problem is then I had to change the, the complex structure. I had to do a conjugation on the CP2. Right. And that I haven't tried, but it may be possible. Instantons do exist on CP2, as I well see. as anti-instantons. Right. So there is, must be a way to do that, but I just haven't had time to I think see. about it. Because very there's much. a twistorial way too, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Sorry, there's one online question, I think. Uh, if someone can read it out. Please go ahead. Please. Uh, yes, yes, please go ahead. Can you hear my question? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, yes. Ah, okay, good. Hi. Um, uh, great talk, Nia. Thanks very much. Um, but I, I have a question um, about the projection onto S4. When you're doing the Wilson lines on CP2, are you using spin C structure because CP2 doesn't admit spinners? Oh, that's indeed correct. But I'm only looking at 
uh, I'm not looking at spinners, I'm looking at probe charges, as Denjo was saying. So the Wilson line I can define in any representation. Uh, okay, so you're not using spinners. Yeah, but if I do, I mean, we haven't gotten to the point of looking at quarks. If we do, you're absolutely right. We had to use a spin C structure, which I believe can be done without too much trouble. Okay. It can, it can be done in CP2, but um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I've heard before that you can get S4 by projecting down from CP2, but I've never thought about how, I mean, somehow you must get ordinary spinners on S4. Oh, right, right. Oh, you're, that's a point you're talking about. about. How does the conjugation symmetry work with the spinners? Yeah. 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 No, I haven't thought very much about spinners, I have to confess. No. Okay, we finished five minutes early, but we are five minutes over time now. Sorry about that. <laughs> okay. S2 cross S2. Yes, I did think about that to some extent. And it's, again, a, a puzzling space because S2 cross S2 modulo permutation symmetry is CP2. So you might say that, well, that could also be done. Okay. But the problem for me was factoring out the gauge transformations is much harder there. Okay, whereas this one is much simpler. So we tried S2 cross S2, but this is easier. Okay, let's thank Parmesan for a great thank talk. You. Thank you.